Joining me now to look at the week in federal politics are two members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Mia Rabson is a national political reporter for the Canadian Press, and Ian Bailey is a parliamentary reporter with the Globe and Mail. Both of you, thanks for joining us. We are going to talk about, see, I lied. We're not talking really about the week. We're really going to talk about the big story of the week, which was the budget. Um, Mia, I want to start with you uh, because you cover energy and the environment. There were about $12 billion worth of measures in this budget touching on the environment, some of which were revealed by the environment minister last week week. Uh, what stands out for you? And I want to also get your thoughts specifically on one of the controversial measures, which was these billions of dollars in credits for carbon capture. Weigh in on well, that. That in many ways is the only the big new thing in the budget. We did see last week when they released their new emissions reduction plan, they mm -hmm. talked about that nine billion of these measures that were in the budget. So we were expecting a lot of those. What we didn't have was the dollar figure on carbon capture and storage for this tax credit. They talked about it a year ago in the budget. They've been spending the year consulting, figuring out what will qualify and how much it should be. And now we know sort of the details. The industry, the oil and gas industry, has said for quite a while now that this is the only way that they'll be able to meet their targets uh, to cut emissions and, and to continue to produce oil. But it's incredibly controversial because for on the other side of things, the environment uh, lobby, climate activists, they're saying that that's what they want. They want them to stop producing oil. That's the only way we will meet our climate targets. So the Liberals are caught between those two as they often have been in the last several years. And they're trying to do this. They seem to think it is also the only way we'll meet our targets. Environment Minister Stephen Gilbo, of course, before he was a politician, was one lobbying against stuff like this. And now he's the environment minister. And he's saying himself, we, we're not going to be at zero oil and gas in 2050. We're going to be at zero emissions, they hope, but there's still going to be some demand. And the only way for that to happen is if you can find a way to capture and prevent emissions from coming from on the production side. So that's where the liberals are going on this, but it definitely didn't sit well uh, with the environment to, and climate activists who were quite disappointed in this budget oh, for oh, it. I want to get to Ian in a second, but I want to put two points to you which came out yesterday on Budget Day. The environmentalists are saying that it's going to be, a, it's going to be the equivalent of $7 billion of tax credits uh, to the industry. But there also, there's a lot of debate about whether uh, carbon capture and storage even works. Uh, weigh in, you follow this, this field. Yeah, I mean, right now, the technology does not seem to be there to, to do what the Liberals want, which is capture 100% of the emissions and store them. Right now, the only major project that Canada has is the Boundary Dam in Saskatchewan, which is on a coal plant. Uh, it's been in place for about seven years. Its goal is 90%, not 100%, and in seven years, it's never come close to that. In fact, last year, for a number of reasons, it caught 44%. So the, t the technology does not seem to be there right now. The hope is that by investing in it and pushing on this, that maybe they will get there. Uh, but it will be very interesting to see these tax credits that are supposed to go for 100% capture, if they can't do it, how do they? How are these tax credits actually going to work? Because they're going to be getting them up front for this technology. Okay, Ian, I want to. You, you can weigh in on this if you want, but I'll, I'll ask you more generally. What stands out for you when you look at this budget? What what caught your attention? Well, you know, you can go through this budget document and see uh, interesting little points throughout the uh, hundreds of pages therein. I was struck by the um, the finance minister declaring uh, sort of a, a turn in spending, perhaps a sort of a turn that spending is not infinite that um, it may be time to sort of rein things in and sort of, uh, sort of uh, you know, curb spending and kind of uh, pull that back. I was uh, also struck by the absence of detail and even a commitment or a detailed promise on pharmacare, mm -hmm. which is clearly a, a big piece of the government's uh, deal with the new Democratic Party. And of course, I, I was surprised by the, the fact that the, the spending on defense did not reach the 2% target. I mean, you know, clearly there are billions of more dollars being spent on defense, but it, it's not getting up to that 2%, especially given the Prime Minister's recent rhetoric on this issue. Right. What, um, I think one of the interesting things, too, that I mean, many commentators were actually saying that they were surprised, as you, you allude to it, that the Liberal government, after its agreement with the NDP, uh, and after much was said prior to this budget, that the Liberals did not announce more spending in this budget. And you were, you're suggesting that they're actually rebranding themselves as moderate in terms of spending? Well, you know, for liberals who are concerned, uh, I guess you call them blue liberals, or liberals concerned about, uh, you know, excessive spending, you know, the, the, the finance minister had a lot to say that uh, some of them might find uh, appealing or sort of reassuring. 
So yes, I found that kind of uh, kind of striking in this uh, in her remarks. Uh, around this budget, yes. Okay. Um, Mia, in terms of the environment and the economy, the, the budget contained two new large entities. One is called the Canada Growth Fund, uh, which they hope will attract literally tens of billions of dollars from the private sector uh, to fund green projects and others. And they also announced this new Canada Innovation and Investment Agency. There's not a lot of details on that. These, uh, some critics in the budget lockup and around the country are saying these are reminiscent of the government's $35 billion infrastructure bank, which didn't really fund a lot of things to date, hasn't. And these super cluster uh, program, which have not had the hoped for results or not, certainly not the, the advertised results. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, these new two, these two new funds uh, or programs is, is whatever you want to call them. We don't have a lot of detail, so it's hard to know exactly how they're going to work. But there does seem to be, whether it's this government or past governments, they sort of they create these these investment vehicles that don't work. And then instead of trying to find out figure out a solution, make them work, they come up with new investment vehicles. There's no doubt we need billions of investment, trillions of investment probably in clean technology if Canada is going to be the leader in this industry that we want to be and that the economy probably demands that we be for us to, to have the economic growth going forward. Uh, but without a lot of detail, it's hard to know what what's going to be different about these, why these might work compared to what's happened in the past. Uh, it's it's there's still a lot to know. Uh, they put some big figures out there, and that's often what you see on budget day, right? Lots mm -hmm. of big numbers, lots of sort of shiny objects, but when you actually start looking at how it's going to work or what the details are, that's not provided yet. So we still have a ways to go to understand what these new, new vehicles are going to be. You know, Ian, in terms of how this is playing out politically, um, well, first of all, as, as we alluded to, this is the first budget since the Liberals struck their deal with the NDP several weeks ago. Uh, how much NDP influence did you see in the budget, if any, uh, and how's it all playing out politically? Well, in terms of the NDP influence, obviously the NDP uh, are, are taking credit for some aspects of the budget. And um, clearly, I, I don't believe we would have seen the billions of dollars allotted for dental care okay. without that uh, agreement with the NDP and without the Liberals needing the NDP as a kind of partner to sort of appeal to progressive voters. Um, we saw the Prime Minister within the last hour talking a great deal about Denticare as well and sort of beginning the process of, of building that program. So I think that is sort of, uh, you know, shows some NDP influence. We didn't see much on Pharmacare, mm -hmm. if anything if at all, Pharmacare. We were told, obviously, in a briefing yesterday that uh, by senior uh, government official that, that, that more work needs to be done and that's a ways off in terms of uh, providing some detail on that. The finance minister talked about a budget in chapters. I think she talked about four chapters, and so maybe uh, PharmaCare will be in the next chapter a, a year from now. Well, what do, we, what do we make of that? Because I've just spoken with a healthcare advocate, uh, and they are sort of out, they're, I, I guess you could say up in arms, but that, that PharmaCare hasn't moved ahead further and faster. And yet when you talk to uh, NDP leader, we spoke with uh, Jagmeet Singh yesterday, he said, no, no, this was never expected this year and in this budget. Uh, we have a reference in the budget to it will be enshrined in legislation starting next year. Uh, so everything in his due time, he didn't seem exorcised about it, but the people who are lobbying for it, some of them are, are deeply disappointed. Any thoughts on that, uh, Mia? Well, I mean, I suppose if you're looking at it from the glass half full side, PharmaCare was mentioned in the budget because the Liberals didn't mention PharmaCare at all in their platform. So I suppose that's a step forward yeah. on that front. They have, the Liberals have been talking about this for several years. Uh, it is a very complicated transition to make. There's a number of factors, including the number of private insurance companies that are involved. Uh, it's it's not going to be a simple change or a simple transition and it's also very expensive so i think that for the for the most part they're trying to make sure they get it right and that they don't sort of end up with a, a boondoggle a billion another billion dollar boondoggle the last thing any government wants uh it's but the fact that the ndp are not up in arms about it really signals that the liberals were clear for when they had signed that agreement of what was possible and what was likely coming in in this budget so they didn't tent they sort of tamped down expectations mm -hmm. to begin with with care Okay, Ian, the Conservatives are not all of this. They're saying that the Liberals are squandering the $35 billion they claim, uh, which were hard-earned hard and paid taxes from consumers, Canadians, but of course that money comes from other sources as well. Uh, what do you make of the Conservative reaction? Well, it, it's consistent, I guess, with some of the Conservative concerns on these files. Um, um, you know, the Conservatives are saying, I guess, what we would expect them to say at this point um, with an interim leader, and um, you know, we'll see how things play out eventually when there's a um, a full-time leader to take the party forward on some of these policies.
Mm -hmm. a, lot of, you know, a, lot of it is a, a lot of it is awaiting that, that result. Listen, I want to thank both of you, and we will probably have a, a quieter week next week with Parliament off for the next two weeks. Thanks, uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.